Samson and Delilah. Years and rulers passed away. The Philistines along the coast grew mightier and mightier. But the children of Israel too easily forgot the lessons of their past and turned away from the Lord to worship their neighbors' heathen gods. And because they were again doing evil in the sight of the Lord, they again fell into the power of their enemies. For forty years, the warlike Philistines, who themselves worshipped a strange fish-like idol they called Dagon, oppressed the people of Israel. And among the loosely scattered tribes, there was no leader close enough to God to find the strength to free the Israelites from their new enemy. Yet there was a certain man named Manoah of the tribe of Dan, who still loved and served the Lord. His wife had borne no children, and it seemed she never would. But one day an angel of the Lord appeared to Manoah's wife and told her that she would have a son. Take care that you drink no wine or strong drink, the angel said to her, nor eat food that is not clean, for you shall bear a son who will be a Nazarite, a man who belongs to God, and he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. And he shall not cut his hair for as long as he lives, for if his hair is cut, he breaks his vow with God, and the Lord will no longer be with him. It happened as the angel said, the woman bore a son and called him Samson. The child grew into a youth of extraordinary strength, and the long hair that was a symbol of his covenant with God fell about his shoulders. By the time he had reached manhood, he was the strongest man in all the land, blessed by God and destined for great things. Yet, though he felt the spirit of the Lord moving in him at times, he was not always wise. His hatred for the enemy Philistines did not prevent him from admiring their women. This, in time, caused great trouble for him, and yet it also was the cause of eventual disaster for the Philistines. His feats of strength were many and marvelous. One day, while he was on his way to meet a Philistine woman whom he wished to marry against his parents' wishes, a young mountain lion leaped down from its lair and roared menacingly in Samson's path. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and Samson seized the lion with his bare hands and tore it apart as easily as if the wild and clawing creature had been a timid young goat. After that he went along his way to make the Philistine woman his bride. But the Philistines did not like this Israelite, and even at the wedding feast they persuaded the woman to help them deceive Samson with a trick. In his terrible rage at being deceived, Samson used his great strength to kill thirty of their countrymen, and one awful incident led to another. Again the Philistines cheated the young man with the flowing hair, and again Samson swore vengeance. This time he went out and caught three hundred wild foxes and tied their tails together two by two. Then, between each pair of foxes, he tied a piece of dry wood to the knotted tails and set the wood on fire. When the firebrands were blazing hotly with great tongues of flame, he set the foxes loose to run through the tall, ripe corn in the Philistines' fields. In their agony and terror, the foxes ran wildly from one field to another, and the blazing firebrands burned up the sheaves of harvested grain, the growing corn, the olive groves, and the vineyards of the Philistines. Now the Philistines, in their turn, took their own terrible revenge. They went to the home of Samson's Philistine wife and burned it to the ground. Both the woman and her father died by fire. Then Samson's anger blazed again. He leaped upon the Philistines with all his strength and slaughtered them in great numbers. I will have vengeance, he roared. I will not cease until I am avenged of you. When the dead lay thick in front of him, he turned away and made a new home for himself in the land of the tribe of Judah. The Philistines were not finished with him yet. An army of them went into the land of Judah and pitched their war tents in Lehi, hoping to find Samson and have done with him. The men of Judah had been trying to keep peace with these savage Philistines, and when they saw the army their alarm was great. Why have you come here, they asked. Why do you bring your forces here against us? We have come to find Samson, they replied, to capture him and bind him as a captive so that we can do to him as he has done to us. The men of Judah knew where Samson could be found. They had no wish to betray him, but neither did they want the anger of the Philistines to be turned against themselves. 
So they went to Samson's home among the rocks and called him out. Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us, they said to him? Would you have us suffer for what you have done to them? I did nothing more to them than they have done to me, said Samson. Yet we will have to bind you as a captive and take you to them, the men of Judah told him, or their anger will descend on us. Take me then and bind me, Samson said. Only swear to me that you will not kill me yourselves while I am bound. They gave their promise and bound him tightly with two new cords, then took him from his sheltering rock down to the waiting Philistines. When his enemies saw him coming, bound and apparently helpless, they shouted with triumph and bloodlust. But Samson was far from helpless. Power surged through his mighty body and strength poured into his limbs. He flexed his muscles and strained against his bonds. They burst from his arms and fell off in broken strands as if they had been flax burnt through by fire. When his hands were free, he searched upon the ground and picked up the sun-dried jawbone of a long-dead ass, and with it he lashed out at the men who had come to take him. Again and again he struck his furious blows with the sharp side of the bone until a thousand Philistines lay dead upon the earth around him. With the jawbone of an ass have I killed a thousand men, his great voice bellowed out victoriously. And when he had done with killing, he threw the bone away. After that, he was recognized as a powerful judge among the people of Israel. But then, instead of staying away from the people who hated him, Samson went to Gaza. This was a great stronghold of the Philistines and a dangerous place for any Israelite to visit, and dangerous especially for Samson. Word flew around the city that he was there. Samson is in Gaza, so the people said. And the Philistines rejoiced at this unexpected chance to trap him. When evening came, they arranged themselves around the great stone walls of the city and secured the heavy gates. All night they lay quietly in wait for him, planning to ambush him when he came out in the morning. But again, Samson was too much for them. He did not wait for morning, but approached the gates at midnight. His huge arms reached for the barred gates and tore them from the walls, posts, crossbar and all, and carried them away upon his shoulders to drop them on a hilltop looking down on Hebron. Sometime afterward, he came to love a woman in the valley of Sorek, a Philistine whose name was Delilah. It was not long before his enemies discovered that Samson was bewitched with love for Delilah and that he was often to be found with her in her home. The lords of the Philistines went to her and proposed a bargain. Entice him, they said. Use your wiles upon him to find out where his great strength lies and how we may defeat him. If you discover his secret, we will each give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. It was a large sum of money, an alluring offer. Delilah agreed. The next time Samson came, she began at once to coax his secret out of him. Tell me, she said seductively, what is it that makes you so wonderfully strong, and what manner of cords can possibly tame your marvelous strength? Samson was not quite so easily enticed as she had hoped. If I were bound with seven green willow switches that have not been dried, he answered, I should be as weak as any other man. Delilah passed her report on to the rulers of the Philistines. They came to her house with the seven green willow switches and lay in wait while Delilah soothed Samson into sleep. Then she bound Samson with the supple green stems and called out, Samson, awake! The Philistines are upon you. Samson woke up and stretched. The willow bindings broke as easily as a strand of rope is broken when it touches fire. You have mocked me, said Delilah sadly. Why do you tell me lies when you know I would not harm you? Now tell me truly, with what may your great strength be bound? Only with new ropes that have never been used before, said Samson. Then I shall be as weak as any other man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him while he slept. Awake, Samson, she called out. The Philistines are upon you. Samson got up lazily, and the ropes around him snapped like threads. You have mocked me again, Delilah cried reproachfully. You have told me lies. Now tell me truly how you may be bound. 
If you weave my hair into the web of cloth you are weaving on your loom, he said, then I shall be as weak as any other man. Later, Samson slept again, and Delilah quickly went to work at her weaving loom. She parted Samson's long, thick hair into seven strands and wove each one into the fabric on her weaving frame, then fastened the fabric securely with the sturdy pin of the loom to make doubly sure of subduing Samson. The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But the Philistines, still hiding, had no chance to fall upon him, for Samson was as strong as ever. He rose up without effort and walked away, dragging with him the weaving frame, the pin, and the web of cloth in which his long hair was entangled. Delilah was left with a broken loom and a growing fear that she would never see the silver promised her by the Philistine rulers. Yet Samson kept coming back to her, and Delilah kept on trying to lure his secret out of him. You have mocked me now three times, she rebuked him sorrowfully, and still you have not told me where your great strength lies. How can you say I love you when your heart is not truly with me? And she pressed him daily, pleading and coaxing, until Samson became harassed beyond endurance. Tired of her constant badgering, he at last gave up the secret that had been locked so long in his heart. There has never been a razor on my head, he said. For I am a Nazarite, given to the Lord from birth. If I should let my hair be shaved, then my strength would go from me, and I would truly be as weak as any other man. Delilah saw that he was telling the truth at last. As soon as Samson's back was turned, she sent for the Philistine lords. Come up this one last time, she said urgently. He has told me the secret of his heart. The Philistine leaders went to her with the money in their hands. Delilah hid them and greeted Samson with smiles and words of love. When the big man was asleep, she called out softly for a Philistine to come quickly with a razor. Shave off the seven locks of his head, she ordered. The man raised the razor and deftly slashed it through the thick tangle of hair. One after the other, the seven locks came off and dropped like dead leaves to the floor. Delilah shook Samson roughly. The Philistines are upon you, Samson, she cried harshly, and struck him with her hand. He awoke out of his sleep, thinking that this time would be the same as other times. I will shake myself, he said, and go out as before. He did not know that his long hair was cut short, that his vow to the Lord had been broken for him, and that his heaven-sent strength had left him. When the Philistines sprang from their hiding places, he swung out to strike them down. To Samson's great alarm, he suddenly felt as weak as any ordinary man, and his blows were useless. His gloating enemies captured him with ease and cruelly thrust out his eyes to make certain that he never again could do them any harm. They took him back to Gaza, where they bound him with brass chains and thrust him into prison. Day after day he labored in the prison house, turning a heavy millstone and grinding corn to make bread for his enemies. Meanwhile, the rulers of the Philistines were gathering together from all corners of their land to prepare a great sacrificial offering to Dagon, their fish-like god, and to rejoice in their triumph over Samson. Our god has delivered our enemy into our hands, they said joyfully. Samson, the destroyer of our country, who killed so many of us, will never again do any harm. When the long preparations were complete and all the prayers had been offered up to Dagon, the Philistines thronged in even greater numbers than before into the huge stone temple of their false god to feast and drink and celebrate their deliverance from the strong man whom they had managed to imprison several weeks before. At the height of the merrymaking, someone, one of the Philistine lords, shouted out drunkenly, Call for Samson so that we may have sport with him! Others picked up the cry, and soon they called for Samson to be brought out of the prison house so that they might make fun of him. A young lad led him to the temple in his rags and chains, and he was made to stand between the pillars of the temple where all could see and throw their taunts at him. There were three thousand men and women who stood there laughing at him for his helplessness, among them all the lords and rulers of the Philistines, and they gloated at the sight of a giant made blind and powerless by their cunning. They did not notice how long his hair had grown during his time in prison. As he stood between the pillars and heard their mocking shouts, Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, 
Let me feel the pillars that support this house so that I may lean upon them. He leaned upon them as if weak and tired, and the people jeered. O oh Lord God, he prayed, remember me, I pray you. Strengthen me only this once, O oh God, so that I may be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. He took hold of the two middle pillars that supported the temple and braced himself. Let me die with the Philistines, he cried. Then Samson tightened his grip upon the pillars and bowed forward with all his might. The pillars crashed to the floor in a terrible rumble of sound. The temple shattered down and crumbled into ruins on top of all the people in it, all the merrymakers, all the priests of Dagon, and all the rulers of the Philistines. Thus, in his death, Samson destroyed more Philistines than he had killed in all his life, and the power of the Philistines was broken with the temple. It was to be many years before they regained sufficient strength to again threaten the peace and freedom of the children of Israel. The Story of Ruth Now it happened in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in the tribe lands of Judah took his wife and two sons into the country of Moab where the grass was green and food was plentiful. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. The two sons were named Malon and Chilion. It was not a very long journey, for Moab lay directly across the Salt Sea from the land of Judah. Nor was the land itself unknown to the people of Israel, for it was from a mountain peak in Moab that Moses had seen the promised land for the first and only time. Yet it was a strange land, and it was no small venture for a family of Israelites to leave their home and friends to start a new life among strangers. The Moabites were Gentiles, and worshipped strange gods. At times there was bitter warfare between them and the people of Israel, but this was a time of peace, and the family of Elimelech settled quietly in the country of Moab. They brought their own faith with them, and prospered in the land. Their new neighbors welcomed them with kindness, and the land was fertile, so that there was always bread to eat. Yet life was not always easy, and the woman Naomi suffered many tragedies. Elimelech, her husband, died, and she was left with her two sons to care for her. In the course of time, her sons took wives from among the women of Moab. The name of Chilion's wife was Orpah, and the name of Malan's wife was Ruth. For about ten years all was well. Ruth and Orpah became devoted to their mother-in-law, and she to them. And though they were Moabite women, they gave up the gods of their people to worship the God of Israel. Then Malon and Chilion both died, leaving Naomi without either husband or sons. She wanted to return to her own country, for she was lonely among the Moabites without her family around her. Also she had heard that the Lord had ended the famine in Judah and given his people bread, so that it was no longer necessary for her to stay away from home. So she left the place where she was living and started on her way back to the land of Judah. Her two loving daughters-in-law left with her, for with their own husbands gone it seemed to them at first that they had no one left but Naomi. They did not want to lose her too, and they did not want her to be alone and sad. But Naomi, for her part, had no wish for Ruth and Orpah to be lonely in the land of Judah as she herself was now in the country of Moab. When the three women had gone some little distance together, she stopped, and they stopped with her. Go now, she said. Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have been kind to my sons and to me. And may he grant that each of you marry again, so that you may find rest and happiness, each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and the young women wept. We cannot leave you, they sobbed. Let us go with you and live among your people. But Naomi answered, No, turn back, my daughters. Why should you go with me? Turn again, my daughters, go your way. I am old, too old to have another husband. And even if I should marry again and have more sons, would you wait for them until they were grown? Would you do that instead of marrying other husbands here? No, you must stay. For I am grieved for your sakes and wish you to remain in your own land and be happy with your people. 
Ruth and Orpa wept again, and Orpa said a sad farewell. She kissed her mother-in-law as the tears trickled down her cheeks. Slowly and sadly, she turned away. But Ruth clung to Naomi and held her close. Look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods, Naomi said gently. You must go after her and do what she does. Do not make me leave you, pleaded Ruth. Do not ask me to turn away from following you. For wherever you go, there will I go too. And wherever you stay, there will I stay with you. Your people shall be my people, and your God shall be my God. Where you die, there will I die, and there will I be buried. May the anger of the Lord be upon me, if anything but death parts you from me. Naomi said no more. She could see that Ruth was steadfast in her purpose and would not be turned away. In silence she walked on. Ruth followed her, and in her heart Naomi was glad that Ruth was with her. So the two women traveled together to the town of Bethlehem. Arriving there at the beginning of the barley harvest, when the fields were rich with grain, and the people of Israel were rejoicing because the Lord had sent them plentiful crops. Is this Naomi? They cried out in welcome when they saw the women. Yet in spite of all their greetings, it was a sad return for Naomi who had left her home ten years before with a husband and two fine sons, only to come back poor, empty-handed, and alone, but for the Moabite girl Ruth. Their first concern was to find food. In Moab they owned land, but here in Bethlehem they had nothing of their own, and no means of earning silver even to buy bread. Now it was the custom among the people of Israel that every farmer, when he and his laborers reaped the grain and gathered it into bundles, would permit the poor and hungry to follow behind the reapers and gather all the loose stalks that had fallen by the way. And it so happened that one of the richest farmers in Bethlehem was a man named Boaz, who was not only a mighty man of wealth, but a kinsman of Elimelech, Naomi's husband. Naomi did not know how rich he had become, nor did she give the matter any thought. But Boaz, too, was reaping at this time. Ruth looked around the strange new land, saw the great harvest of barley being reaped on all sides of the town, and took note of the custom that permitted the poor to glean the fields for whatever the reapers might have left. Let me go now to the fields, she said to Naomi, and gather grain from whoever allows me to glean. And Naomi answered, Go, my daughter. So Ruth went into the fields and gathered the fallen stalks of grain left by the reapers, and it was her good fortune to chance upon a part of the great field belonging to the wealthy Boaz. As the day passed, Boaz came out of the city to watch his reapers at harvest. He walked slowly through the tall grain, looking about him at the workers and the growing piles of sheaves. Suddenly he saw a young woman who was a stranger to him. He saw, too, that she was fair of face and working diligently. Who is she? he asked his overseer. She is the Moabite maiden who came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab, the overseer answered, for he knew her story. She asked leave to glean and gather behind the reapers among the sheaves. I gave permission, and she has worked hard since morning with scarcely any rest. Boaz looked at her with even greater interest. So this was the young woman who had come back with Naomi. He, too, had heard the tale of her departure from Moab and her devotion to his kinswoman. He watched her for a while, and then made his way between the sheaves to where she worked. "'Hear me, my daughter,' Boaz said to her, and she raised her head to look at him. "'Do not go to any other field to glean. Stay here with my maidens and follow after them. My young men will not disturb you. I will see to that. And when you are thirsty, go to the drinking vessels and drink the cool water which the men have drawn.' Gather whatever you wish until the harvest is over. Ruth bowed low to Boaz in her gratitude. I thank you, my lord, she said. But tell me why I have found favor in your sight so that you take notice of me, for I am a stranger and did not expect such kindness. I have heard all that you have done for your mother-in-law Naomi since the death of your husband, Boaz answered. I know how you left your father and your mother in the land of your birth to come here to live among strangers, so that you could be with Naomi and care for her. May the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for protection, reward you in full for the good you have done. She thanked him for his kindness, yet there was more to come. Go and glean, he said, 
but at mealtime come back here to eat bread with the reapers. And so she did. She sat beside the reapers and they passed her parched corn until she had had enough. Then she arose, taking with her what she had not been able to eat, and went back into the field to glean. When she was out of earshot, Boaz gave more orders to his men. Let her glean all she needs, he commanded, even among the sheaves you have already gathered. Also, as you reap, let some handfuls fall on purpose, and leave them there for her. Do not reproach her no matter what she takes. It is my wish that she should have all that she can carry. So she gleaned in the field until evening, gathering many more stalks than she had been able to find in the morning. When she beat out what she had gleaned, she found that she had about a bushel of barley, an unusual amount for one day's work. She took her barley and went into the city. And there she gave it to her mother-in-law with the food she had saved from her meal with Boaz and the reapers. Naomi was amazed. Where did you glean today, she asked. And how did you gather so much? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. It was a man named Boaz with whom I gleaned today, Ruth answered. Boaz, said Naomi, greatly pleased that Ruth should have been noticed by this man of all men. May the Lord bless him for his kindness. The man is near of kin to us, one of our closest kinsmen. It is good that you are gleaning in his fields. He also said to me that I should stay with his reapers and his maidens in the fields until the end of harvest, Ruth told her. That is good, my daughter, said Naomi. Then you will not need to look for any other field to glean in, and Boaz surely will protect you. So Naomi was glad, and Ruth stayed with the maidens of Boaz, gleaning in his fields until the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest. During all that time she lived with her mother-in-law and gave her comfort. Naomi, in her turn, was more concerned for Ruth than for herself. Ruth was young and fair to look at, and it was right that she should marry again and find happiness in a home of her own. To live as Ruth was living now was not what Naomi wanted for her loyal daughter-in-law. Therefore she said to Ruth at the end of harvest, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for you, that you may have a home and be provided for? And Boaz, with whose maidens you have been working, is he not our kinsman? And you know that he is winnowing barley tonight upon the threshing floor. Bathe and anoint yourself with fine perfumes and put on your loveliest robes, and then go down there to him. Let him first eat and drink with his men, and afterward approach him. He will tell you what to do. All you tell me to do, I will do, said Ruth. That night, when Boaz had done with eating and drinking, and his heart was merry, he lay down on the threshing floor with his head on a soft heap of grain. At midnight he awoke suddenly, and knew that someone was with him. Who is it? he called out, startled. It is Ruth, your handmaid, she answered. I have come to you for help, for you are a near kinsman of mine through Elimelech. The Lord bless you, my daughter, Boaz said. You have shown kindness again, for you have not followed the young men, either rich or poor, but have come to me. And now, my daughter, do not be afraid. I will do whatever you ask and provide whatever you need. The people of this city know that you are a good and virtuous woman, and all will be well with you. Now it is true that I am your near kinsman, for I was related to your husband who died, but there is a man who is more closely related than I. Tomorrow we will find him out if he will do his part as the closest kinsman. If he does, then let him do it. But if he is not able to, then I shall do it in his place." He did not say that he had come to love Ruth, and had secret hopes that the closer kinsman would not be able to perform his family duty in caring for the daughter-in-law of the late Elimelech. And Ruth did not say that she had come to love Boaz, and had no real interest in any closer kin. Both she and Boaz would abide by the custom that the closest relative of a man who had died had first right to buy his property and marry the widow. He was also expected to take responsibility for the dead man's mother, if she was not still married herself. What Boaz must do before declaring his love for Ruth was to find out if the nearest male relative would claim his rights and duties. The next day Boaz went to the city gate where the elders of the city were usually to be found, and where, sooner or later, his kinsmen would be sure to pass. Boaz sat down and waited. Meanwhile, Ruth had gone back to Naomi with six measures of barley as a gift from Boaz. Do not go empty-handed to your mother-in-law, Boaz had said, 
and Ruth gave Naomi his present of food while she told the older woman every word that Boaz had said to her. Naomi listened and nodded. That is good, she said. Now sit down and wait until you know how this matter will end, for the man will not rest until he has finished the thing this day. Ruth waited with Naomi, and Boaz waited at the gate until the kinsmen of whom he had spoken came by. Ho! Boaz called. Turn aside. Sit down here with me. The kinsmen turned aside and sat down. Then Boaz sent for ten men of the elders to sit down with him and his kinsmen to witness the discussion, and he spoke thus to the kinsmen. Naomi, who has returned from the country of Moab, has land to sell which was our relative Elimelech's. I ask you now, in the presence of these elders, if you wish to redeem it in accordance with your right. If you wish, then do so. If not, then I shall do so. I will redeem it, said the kinsman, glad of such an opportunity. But you know, Boaz reminded him, that on the day you buy the land you must take Ruth the Moabite woman, Malon's widow, to be your wife, so that she may have children and her family will not end with her. And you shall also care for Naomi, the woman's mother-in-law. That I cannot do, the man declared, or I shall lose my own inheritance, for I have a family already. Take my right as your own. I cannot use it myself. Boaz had heard all that he needed. In front of his kinsmen and the ten elders, he announced what he would do. You are witnesses this day that I am buying from Naomi all that was Elimelech's, all that was Chilion's, and all that was Malon's. Moreover, I am taking Ruth, the Moabite woman who was Malon's wife, to be my wife, so that the family of Elimelech continues on this earth. Naomi also shall I care for until the end of her days. You are witnesses? We are witnesses, the elder said. May your house prosper. Then Boaz went back to Ruth where she awaited him and took her for his wife. In happiness they married, and soon the Lord gave Ruth a child. The women of the city rejoiced with their friend Naomi. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you without a kinsman, they said joyfully. May his family name be famous throughout Israel, and he shall be to you a restorer of your life and a comfort in your old age. You are blessed indeed, for the daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has borne a son to the family of Elimelech. Naomi laid the child on her bosom and was comforted. She nursed him lovingly through his babyhood, and the women said, It is as if Naomi had a son herself. And it was so, for she loved him as her own. Ruth and Boaz named their boy Obed, and in great happiness they watched him becoming a sturdy lad who walked in the ways of the Lord. Obed grew to manhood and had a son named Jesse. Jesse, when he became a man, married and had several sons. One of them was David, the singing shepherd boy who was to be a mighty king of Israel. And from David's family came the savior of mankind, a baby born in Bethlehem. Thus did Ruth, the kindly Moabite woman who believed in the God of Israel, give life to an Israelite family that led down through the years to Mary, Joseph, and the gentle Jesus.